Well, hi, and welcome back, Mrs. 80's fourth graders, and whoever else might be listening, Mr. Phillips here, reading By the Great Horn Spoon by G Sid Fleischman. I always want to call him G Jim Fleischman. Boy, that was a good chapter, that chapter 16, wasn't it? See, that dentist, that quote-unquote dentist, was really Cut-Eye Higgins. They found out he was posing as a dentist, so Praiseworthy and Jack went and found him, and lo and behold, the town folk were about to kill him. They were about to hang him from a tree because he uh, stole a horse. Well, they talked the town folk out of that by pretending Jack had a toothache, needed to see a dentist, something terrible, and then they talked the folk into not hanging him at all. Wait till a new dentist comes to town and then hang him. And so they, his life was spared, and they got to question him about the map, and it turns out there was a map. It was a map to a gold mine, but it had been found by other people, and it was being mined. So the map, it was worthless information, no good at all. So they went and uh, dug a hole, because they were going to hang him someday, the town folks said. They said, okay, praiseworthy, and Jack, you guys go dig a hole. And let's see, Jack tried not to think about Boston. It would soon be time to start back, and all they had to show for their labors was a worthless map. Poor Aunt Arabella, he thought. They'd lose the house for sure. The entire trip to California was beginning to look like a wild goose chase. When they got the hole four feet deep, they couldn't go any farther. They hit bedrock and struck gold. Oh. Chapter 17. This is the second to last chapter. We're almost done with this book. I kind of don't want it to end. <clears throat> Chapter 17, the 15th of August. Jack very nearly jumped a foot. By the great horn spoon, he yelled. Look. They always say that. It's like, a, you know, oh my gosh, can you believe it? By the great horn spoon. We got to bring that phrase back. That's a good one. I see it. Pay dirt. And praiseworthy exclaimed, yeller as can be. The gold refilled itself like bits of sunlight trapped in the loosened earth. The two partners flung their hats in the air. In sheer exuberance, they clasped arms and swung around and around in the oblong pit. We've done it, Jack. We've done it, Praiseworthy roared. We've struck it rich. It was a moment before Jack, in his excitement, realized that Praiseworthy had called him Jack, not Master Jack, just Jack, plain Jack, the way he'd always wanted it to be. He thought he'd never stop leaping for joy, but then he fished out a golden lump and he beat it with a stone, flat as a button. Remember, gold is soft. When you hit it with a rock, it flattens out. It doesn't smash up or break up. It flattens. Gold is soft. Very heavy, but soft. Cut some stakes. Quick, Jack. Anything would do. Praiseworthy drew his tattered umbrella from their pack and pounded it into the ground. It made a fine corner post for their claim. Jack stripped a fallen pine limb with their clasp knife. Praiseworthy measured out 50 feet by strides, which would give them plenty of elbow room. Soon they had the boundary staked, and Jack ran from corner to corner, hanging tin cans in place. They had their claim, legal as could be. Remember that? I say you stake your claim? put a bunch of stakes around it, put cans on top, and everything within that square, well, that's mine. It's not yours, it's mine. I get to mine this gold. <clears throat> they had their claim, legal as could be, and praiseworthy laughed. Cut Eye Higgins has done us a good turn in spite of himself. After the first day's washing, praiseworthy went to Coloma to buy a long tom and Jack, long tom, and Jack stayed behind with the squirrel gun to keep an eye on things. Within 24 hours, miners had staked claims everywhere around them. The place quickly got the name Grave Diggers Hill. Praiseworthy and Jack worked from morning till night. They carried pay dirt bucket by bucket down the slope to the sluice box in the river. The hole grew wider and longer. They filled a buckskin pouch and tied it off at the top. Hour after hour, Praiseworthy swung the pick, and day after day, Jack emptied the bucket after bucket into the long tom their fortune grew heavier. Won't Aunt Arabella be surprised when we walk in, Jack grinned one night after supper. Praiseworthy was smoking one of his long nine cigars. Why, we'll be able to use sacks of gold for doorstops. Praiseworthy gazed into the coffee fire and his fingers touched Miss Arabella's small portrait, buttoned away in the pocket of his shirt. She was so far away, a continent away, in Boston. He wondered what she was doing at that very moment staring into the fireplace and thinking of him, perhaps? <laughs> but that was nonsense. He told himself quickly and turned from the fire 
he must not forget his place. Once back in Boston, he would take up his old duties again. He was, he was, he reminded himself firmly, born and bred a butler, like his father before him and his father before him. Miss Arabella would be lost without him. Why, Boston would never accept him as anything but what he was, a butler. Still, Boston was a long way off, and there was the sound of the river below to enjoy and the cigar between his teeth to savor. One morning, a miner came rushing up the hill from Shirttail Camp. Doc Higgins has escaped. What's that? said Praiseworthy, picking up his pick, or oh, dropping his pick. Yep, during the night, he used them four sips of his on the jailhouse we built, pulled the nails through like he was yanking teeth, and got a board loose, slipped right out. He's long gone by now, and good riddance. Praiseworthy wiped the sweat that had rolled down into his whiskers. Maybe he learned a lesson, but I doubt it. He's just running from one noose to another. There are plenty of hanging trees in the diggings, and he'll be standing under one sooner or later with his feet off the ground. <clears throat> After almost two weeks of busting ground and shoveling dirt, their claim began to play itself out. The washings grew thinner and thinner. One by one, the underminers, undermi other miners gave up on Gravedigger's Hill. It had boomed, and now it was dying. The boomers pulled, their, boomers pulled their stakes to follow rumors of some other gold strike. On the morning of the 15th of August, the day praiseworthy was to face mount, the mountain ox in bare-fisted combat, the two partners struck their tent. That means they took it down. Praiseworthy seemed in no hurry to keep his appointment in Hangtown. Jack wondered if Praiseworthy had changed his mind. Not on your life, Jack. We'll make it. Jack blindfolded Stubb, and they loaded up. Remember, they had to blindfold the donkey to get it to do what they want? They had 11 heavy pouches of gold dust, worth a fortune in San Francisco, provided we get it there, mused Praiseworthy. We might meet up with road agents again. Exactly. This squirrel gun of ours barely scares off squirrels. Jack, I think the time has come for shooting irons. Jack's heart took a leap. A four-shooter? I think a four-shooter would be an excellent choice. They stood for a last moment, gazing at their claim. The umbrella still rose from a corner with a tin can on top. Praiseworthy left it there. Grave Diggers Hill had been good to them, and they walked away as if they were abandoning an old friend. Almost at once, several Chinese miners with big tails dangling from their flat straw hats moved in to work over the diggings. Good luck, boys, Praiseworthy called. At Coloma, they traded in their pick and shovel, tent, and gold pans. They wouldn't be needing them anymore. They left Coloma on the stage, each with a revolver tucked in his belt. Jack rubbed his hand along the butt of the four-shooter. He felt invincible. He turned for a last look at Stubb. They had sold him to the justice of the peace, and at that moment, the official was sitting in the dust, his legs spread out before him. The burrow stood looking very pleased with himself. I forgot to tell him Stubb thinks he's a mule, said Jack. Praiseworthy smiled. I'd say the justice of the peace just found that out for himself. Sounds like Stubb bucked him right off. They reached Hangtown late in the afternoon. The main street was hung with bunting as if it were the 4th of July. The place swarmed with miners, horses, mules, and burros. It looked to Jack as if every man and animal in the diggings had come to town. When Praiseworthy stepped out of the stagecoach, a shout went up. There he is! It's Bullwhip himself! Pitchpine Billy rushed over with his ears bent under the weight of his hat. It's about time, he spit. The boys was grumbling that you run out on the match. Not that they blame you. Howdy, Jamoka Jack. Howdy, Pitchpine Billy. In another moment, Jimmy from town had crowded around and Buffalo John and Quartz Jackson. You'll have to excuse the missus, said Quartz Jackson. She don't want to watch. Let's get on with it, said Pitchpine Billy. Where is the mountain ox? Eating oysters over at the Chinese Chow Chow, someone answered. He got hungry waiting around. Somebody fetch him. Boys, spread out. The miners formed a large circle in the center of the street. Others climbed on roofs of stores for a better view. When the mountain ox appeared at the doorway of the Chinese restaurant, Jack's heart dropped to his boots. The man from Grizzly Fat Flats grinned. He had a neck like the stump of a tree. There was oyster juice in his beard. His chest looked big around as a flour barrel. He's a large gent at that, said Praiseworthy, studying his opponent at a distance. He handed Jack his revolver, together with the buckskin pouches tucked under his belt, 
and weighted down his pockets. I just wish we'd never come back here, Jack muttered. It's not a fair match, no sir. You want me to back out? Jack took a breath and then shook his head. You gave your word. You've got to stick by it. That's right. And anyway, I intend to lick him. Praiseworthy stripped off his shirt. The mountain ox across the way did the same. He was hairy as a grizzly bear and looked twice as broad. I think we just figured out what's on the cover. That's supposed to be praiseworthy? Is that how you pictured praiseworthy? Maybe the mountain ox, but I'm not sure that's quite how I pictured praiseworthy. Boy, he is ripped. Well, here we go. Let's find out what's going to happen. Jonas T. Fletcher, the undertaker, stood in the clearing. You two gladiators ready? Praiseworthy nodded. The mountain ox wiped the juice from his beard. He grinned and turned to a Chinese in the crowd. Uh, Lee, go fry me up about two dozen more oysters. I'll be there in a minute, as soon as I whip this bull whip, fella. Come out fighting, said the town undertaker. If either one of you gets killed, I'll give him a free funeral job. May the best man survive. The undertaker scurried out of the clearing. Praiseworthy stepped forward, striking a pose with his arms. Elbows in, he told himself. The mountain ox came out with his arms spread like wings of a buzzard. Yeah, maybe that's it. The crowd stood tense. Squirts of chewing tobacco raised silent puffs of dust. Jack's heart was pounding in his ears. The gladiators closed the distance between them, and the pride of Grizzly Flat wasted no time. He swung an arm with enough power to burst through a barn door. When it had run his course, the crowd was astonished to see Praiseworthy still standing. He had felt nothing more than the wind. He had ducked with the greatest of ease. The street brawler, with his wide open stance, signals his punches in advance. Immediately, Praiseworthy countered with a left jab. It didn't amount to much, but it surprised the mountain ox. Jack gazed toward the center of the clearing with a leap of hope. In the afternoon heat, Praiseworthy's back glistened with sweat. The new muscles along his arms and shoulders looked polished. Almost two months in the diggings, swinging a pick from morning till night, had their effect. He had the power to bust through a barn door himself. Come on, ox, finish him off. Don't be scared of him, bullwhip. Again, the mountain ox swung, and again, Praiseworthy escaped with nothing more than a wind burn. He was getting the hang of it. He was vigilant. He concentrated. He knew that one misstep, one miscalculation, and the mountain ox would end the match with a single blow. Five minutes passed. To Jack, it was five hours, five days. The mountain ox swung one haymaker after the other, but Praiseworthy dodged, ducked, or stepped inside. He cut a tall, lithe finger in the afternoon dusk. Having by now made a thorough study of his appointment, as the book advised, remember he read a book about it. You can learn a lot from books. Praiseworthy devised his attack. Left jab, left jab, right jab, he told himself. Keep them coming like bee stings. The mountain ox may be all muscle, but it's nose to nose. The crowd, in excitement, watched and chewed tobacco and squirted juice. Not only was Praiseworthy still on his feet, he hadn't been touched. The oysters in the Chinese chow chow burned to a crisp. Praiseworthy kept jabbing with his left and the mountain ox nose turned as round and red as a tomato. Once when the gladiators had worked themselves to the very edge of the crowd, the mountain ox let fly a carefully aimed wallop. Just as carefully, Praiseworthy ducked and the blow collided with Cheap John, the auctioneer. He went flying backwards, knocking down six miners like so many dominoes. The bout continued without let up, and the sun began to set through the pines. Praiseworthy had hardly exerted himself. He would duck, dispatch a left jab, and resume the stance he remembered so well from The Gentleman's Book of Boxing. That's the book. But the mountain ox had been swinging his arms like a windmill, and now his tongue was very nearly hanging out. His brawler's arm, once so wide, he now seemed to drag at his sides but like a wounded animal, he was still dangerous. Still, it seemed to praiseworthy. The time had come to close the book. Big as he was, the pride of Grizzly Flats, he had a jaw just like other men, and a jaw was a jaw. A final bee sting. The mountain ox shook his head and stuck out his jaw in fury. Praiseworthy stepped in with a right cross from the shoulder exactly as the book had advised, and it felt to him as if he were hitting a barn door. Jack held his breath. The mountain ox was still on his feet five seconds later, but then 
He keeled over backwards like a statue and laid spread eagle in the dust. A roar burst from the crowd and Pit Pine, Pitch Pine Billy rushed in to hold up Praiseworthy's arms. The winner! I don't know how he done it, but you all saw it. The fair name of Hangdown has been saved. Boys, let's celebrate. Praiseworthy pulled on his shirt and Jack handed him his revolver. He stuck it in his belt. The miners were raising noise all around them, but the two partners regarded each other, exchanging a silence. Finally, Praiseworthy said, How was that, Jack? I backed up my reputation fair and square, didn't I? Jack's face glowed as if he had swallowed a lantern. He was bursting with pride. There wasn't a man in the diggings he'd rather have for a partner, not Pitch Pine Billy or Quartz Jackson or Jimmy from town or Buffalo John. It wasn't a fair match. No, sir, Jack grinned. The Mountain Ox can hardly read or write. Why, he doesn't know a bee from a bull's foot. <laughs> so Jack says, no, it wasn't a fair match because he can't read. Why did Praiseworthy win? Because he read that book. He read that book. What was it? Gentleman's Guide to Boxing or something? Yeah, you can learn a lot from books. Well, that was the end of chapter 17. We just got one more chapter. It's called Arrival at the Long Wharf. I think they're going home. I'll see you next time for the last chapter. Adios, my friends.